Hello, Algebra 1 students, and welcome back to Topic 5. Today we're going to focus on Lesson 5.5, which is all about absolute value dilations and reflections. So we're going to start with a little warm-up. Um, your job is to go through and fill out this table, where this table has given you a set of x values up at the top, and you're going to take each of these x values and you're going to substitute them in to each of the functions over on the left. When you go through and substitute them in, you'll have a little math to do. And as a nice helpful hint, we've provided the first three answers for you. So go ahead, try substituting each of those in, see what you get for your answers. Uh, we should take maybe about two minutes to get this done, and then we'll unpause and see how you did. Ready, set, go. All right. Well, hopefully you remembered, and I'll show kind of the first step here, um, and then you can check things out, but hopefully you remembered that to substitute in, we just replace the x on the inside, keeping everything else the same. And these functions have these fun little bars next to it, and we should know by now these are called absolute value bars. And absolute value bars always return the positive version of the answer. So the absolute value of negative 2 is 2, negative 1 is 1, 0 stays 0, right? The absolute value of 0 is just 0. And then we get to kind of the weird one, the absolute value of 1. And you might think, oh, the absolute value is just doing the opposite, right? It turned these negatives into positives, but it is actually giving us a positive every time. So if you do the absolute value of 1, it just stays 1. And so we get 2 and 3. So 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. When we do this second set, we need to be careful about PEMDAS. And so we're going to go through and we have this 2 absolute value, and we're replacing that with a negative 2. Well, PEMDAS says we do what's inside the parentheses first, or inside the absolute value first in this case. Um, so this is going to give us 2, then the absolute value of negative 2 is 2. So you might say, ha, the answer is 22. But we need to know that this 2 that's outside the absolute value is actually multiplying, right? If there's never a sign written, and we always assume multiplication. So this is actually 2 times 2, which gives us 4. As you do the rest, negative 1 becomes positive 1. Positive 1 times 2 is 2. I'll fill in the rest of these, 0. And then these will start to repeat or be the mirror image of the other side. So 4 and then 6. Same thing for this last set over here. When we substitute in negative 2, oops, I put a 2 here, huh? Silly me. Um, I'm going to rewrite this 0.5 as 1 half. That's the same thing, right? 1 half of negative 2. And then it's just like what we did up above. The 1 half stays. There's multiplication. The absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. And I see students struggle all the time with fractions. They think, wait, how do we multiply fractions? And they think, 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 and then they go, oh, wait, we're just doing half of a number, and we know what half of 2 is. Half of 2 is 1. And as we go through here and do the rest, um, you'll find that this one ends up being 0.5, or 1 half, 0 again, and then the mirror image on the other side, 0.5, 1, and 1.5. All right, we're going to come back to this table in just a second. Uh, we're going to introduce some vocabulary first, and then we'll try to apply that vocabulary to what we did for the opener. So here we go. When you go to the optometrist, and do you guys know what an optometrist does? I bet about half of you do. Uh, yeah, the optometrist is kind of like your eye doctor, right? Um, and if they dilate your eyes, uh, your pupils get larger. Right, the black part of your eye gets really big. That's why when you go outside into the sun, it hurts your eyes. You're taking in more light than you're used to, and your brain's like, ouch, why is that happening? Well, in math, when an object or a shape or a graph is dilated, it does either become larger, or in math, we can also use dilation to mean smaller. This is also sometimes called transforming a graph. Right, If you transform it, you can make it bigger or smaller. Now, in Algebra 1, we only talk about how a graph or an equation is dilated vertically. So that means kind of up and down, right? So horizontal vocabulary is wider and skinnier, right? Something can become wider or something can become skinnier. However, our vertical vocabulary is a little bit different. Imagine you had a circle 
and actually I should do a better job here. Imagine you had a circle and it has this much stuff. And then you wanted to grab either end of the circle and pull it up or down. Well, what's going to happen is it's going to make the circle skinnier. There's that horizontal vocabulary, but also taller. And if you start with an object and it becomes taller, then we actually say that that's vertically stretched. I always like to think of someone grabbing this ball right here on either side and stretching it up and down. Maybe you can think of like a rubber band. And then the opposite is true too. If you have, once again, a ball and you wanted to push into it from both sides, that's going to kind of smush it out like this, right? It is going to, again, get skinnier, but it also gets wider. And the idea of pushing an object down where it kind of you know, flattens out like that, in math, we call it being vertically compressed. Um, a nice example is you can think about the Pixar lamp, you know, when it jumps out over the Pixar and it jumps on the eye up and down and then it flattens the eye. The eye kind of, you know, makes a puddle on the ground. That's compressing the eye when you push down on something. All right, so let's tie this all back into absolute value. We've seen the HK form of absolute value before. We know there's A, H, and K. The A value is something we haven't discussed yet. Uh, last class when we did absolute value, we just said A is always 1. Well, A is not always 1. And so today we're going to really play around with different values for A and see how it controls the stretch and compression of your graph. Can you see those A values back on the opener? Right? We had an A value of 2, an A value of 0.5, and an A value, what's hidden here? Oh yeah, the 1, an A value of 1, okay? Um, and we're going to go through and see what happened to the outputs based on our A value. When the A value is 1, let's think of that as kind of like our baseline A value. 1 is what we normally start with. So we got 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. But then when the A value became 2, what happened to all the Y values when you compare them to the Y value up above. And hopefully you're saying, oh, wait, that 2 makes a nice connection. It took all of our original answers, and then it caused them to double. Right? Double means times by 2 multiplied by 2. And so we say that g of x equals 2 times the absolute value of x is vertically stretched when you compare to the original function, right? It's stretched it because it's made the y values bigger. And y values, if you think about the y axis, right? Here's our y axis, here's our x axis. The y axis are like the answers or the outputs. So what's happening here is our outputs are getting bigger. They're going further up or further down on the y axis. H of x, though, our last equation down here, we'll do this one in brown, um, takes these original numbers and does what? Well, hopefully you're noticing that it cuts them all in half. And so we say that h of x equals 0.5 times the absolute value of x is vertically compressed. Now, compressed means the y values got smaller. And as we're about to see, if the y values get smaller, they really get closer to zero. So let's see what this looks like visually instead of me drawing these weird arrows. So I have the graph of three absolute value functions, and mine is in pretty colors, yours is not because color is expensive. Um, and we have three functions here. We have our first function, y equals the absolute value of x. And that's, of course, drawn in black over here. I'm going to maybe call this function 1 just so you can keep it straight. That's our OG, our original function. Okay. We say it's neither compressed nor stretched because it's the parent function. We've used that vocabulary before. This is what all the functions originally look like. But then we have a graph of y equals 2 times the absolute value of x. And I'll label that with a 2 on both sides. And that graph, when you compare it to the black graph, and maybe the easiest way to compare is to compare the same x value but different y values. Let's look at an x value of 2. The y value for the black graph is here. The y value for the blue graph is up here. So how would you compare the black graph to the blue graph? Well, the blue graph is certainly 
taller or bigger than the black graph. The blue graph is also skinnier than the black one. But in our math vocabulary, we took this y value and we brought it up, or we stretched the blue graph. And the reason that that graph is stretched is for a few reasons. Um, you can talk about how it's taller, about how it's skinnier, whatever sounds good to you. I like to think of someone grabbing these ends and then pulling them up. If they pull them up, the rest of the graph has to come along as well. And that's what turns it to matching the blue graph. It gets stretched upwards. So I'll let you fill in whatever you need here. Of course, the last comparison is very similar. We're going to look at the graph that's done in red, and I'll call this one graph 3. Okay. And this last graph, we can do the same comparison. I'm going to take that x value of 2. Here's the same x value down here, and we're going to compare them. How did we get from the graph in black to the graph in red? Well, we dropped down. Right? You can use that same comparison, like let's say someone took this graph and they pulled these ends down. Well, the graph is going to get wider or not as tall. The y values became smaller. So this graph is vertically compressed. Stretched, taller, compressed, shorter. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and pull up Desmos on our phones. I'm going to give you a quick second to do that, but I'm going to start you off with your directions, then you can set up Desmos, and then we'll come back together. So we're going to start with a nice absolute value equation. And we know again that this is A absolute value of X minus H plus K, and I'll zoom in on that for you. Based on this, we know what the vertex is, right? Our vertex is always HK. And I'm going to put negative 1, 1, but then you're going to call me out on this because it shouldn't be negative 1, 1. We know an absolute value or in any HK form, we always do the opposite of H. And so this should actually be a positive 1, 1. All right, here we go. We're going to play around with that 1, 1 function a bunch of times. So what I'd like you to do is on your phone, or if you don't have a phone, look off someone nearby. Um, you're going to use the Desmos graphing calculator app, and this works on a computer too, that's what I'm working on, and you're going to type this following equation into line 1. Then you're going to start a new line and you're going to type this one, including that f of x piece. When you're asked, you're going to click on the blue button to create a slider. So. Go ahead, do those couple things, pause the video, take a minute or two to get things ready. Um, you can, of course, also just go to desmos.com if you don't want to use the Desmos app, but one's usually easier than the other. So pause me, unpause when you're ready. I'm going to go ahead and set things up once you unpause. Ready, set, go. All right, welcome back. We're going to go through and we're going to take a quick piece at Desmos on my side. So here is this. And here's Desmos.com. You're going to click Graphing Calculator, which is right in the middle of the screen. We see it right here. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and pull things up. I'm going to change my settings so the graph looks a little bit cleaner. And then I'll use the keyboard down here just so you can see what I'm writing instead of actually using the actual keyboard. Uh, remember, we need two lines here where our first line is going to say that Y equals and then we said we're going to do 1, the absolute value is by the a, right, x minus 1, close our absolute value, plus 1. So our graph should look like this, and it verifies or proves that our vertex is at 1, 1. Um, and then our second one, we actually have to get to the keyboard, and we're going to do f of x equals, and then we wanted a, so back to the keyboard, absolute value, x minus 1, close your absolute value, plus 1. And it said, when prompted, add a slider. Whew. Okay, now that we've done this, we only see one graph. And the reason we only see one graph is because currently it tells us that A is 1. If A is 1, that means we've graphed the same equation twice. So if I turn this one off just by clicking, you can see that the two graphs are just sitting on top of each other. So let's go back to those directions. For this activity, you'll be moving your slider to a given value of a, and that'll be on the next page. Then you'll sketch the new graph on top of the given function. Lastly, you'll explain how the graph differs from when a equals 1, 
using your new vocabulary, so stretched or compressed. And then as a bonus, can you see how you'd create this graph without Desmos? So there are four graphs on this next page. There are more than that, but the four are what we're going to do first. Um, there are four graphs on this page, and they give you an A value each time. So all you need to do is take your slider and move it to that A value. And then there's a blank down below because it says when a equals 2, f of x is vertically, and you have to fill it in stretched or compressed. And we can even look at the first one, right? Um, so a equals 2. So I'm jumping back here. We're going to grab our slider, a equals 2. And now because our a has changed, our graphs look different. Here is my new graph. And I'm going to need to copy that onto my piece of paper. So to copy it onto the piece of paper could be a little bit challenging because you're like, well, the vertex is in the same place. How do we do it? Well, check out your graph, and you might notice that you can look at the slope here. Now, if you can't see the slope super clearly, make sure you hit that house button on the top right. That'll help you zoom back in, right? Because if you're out here, you're like, I can't see the slope. Well, hit the home button, and you'll be fine. Slope-wise, it looks like I start at the vertex, and I go up 1, 2, and over 1, right? up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. So I think I could probably go through and just go up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1 for the left side. But then to create a V-shaped graph, we also need to go up 2 to the left one, and that gives us the rest of the graph. Now, when you compare the blue graph to the black one, this blue graph is vertically stretched. And we know that because the new graph is, well, what do you want to say about the blue one? It's taller, it's skinnier, the y values are bigger, right? If you compare the two y values at 2 here, right, this one has a y of 2 versus this one has a y of 3, this 2 was stretched up to become a 3, however you want to explain it. All right, so pause me, try these last three, and again, asking yourself, how could you graph this without Desmos as well? Ready, set, go. All right, we're back. We're going to go ahead and see if we can do these without Desmos, right? And then you can double check me here. I think this a value, and I'll remind you of your equation up here, y equals a absolute value x minus h plus k. Um, if we compare this to when we did lines, I think that our a value in a line was the slope. Isn't it also kind of the slope for absolute value as well? Let's look at this one half. If it was the slope, that would tell me to go up one and over two. Up one, so we start at the vertex, and I go up one and then over two, up one over two, and that gives me the first side of my absolute value graph. Same thing the other direction, up one left two, up one left two. And I think this is probably what you get on your Desmos graph as well. And so we can say when a is one half, f of x is vertically compressed. The blue graph is shorter or pushed down from the black graph, right? Um, it's like someone is compressing or jumping on the ends to bring the graph down. And I'll let you guys fill in whatever, whatever vocabulary you wanted here, wider, shorter, anything like that. Let's try three halves. 3 halves. Well, if that's the slope, that's going to be up 1, 2, 3 over 2, up 1, 2, 3 over 2. And I think visually, we can pretty quickly see that this graph is vertically stretched. It's skinnier than the other one. And then last but not least, 2.2. Hmm, 2.2. Well, that's a pretty tough one to graph without Desmos. I'll do 2.2 over 1. So I'm going to go up. 1, 2, 2.2, 2, I'm going to say is right about there, and then over 1. Up 1, 2.2 2 over 1 is again up here, something like that. It's not going to be perfect, but that's fine. Up 2.2 2 over 1, up 2.2 2 is a little larger this time, over 1. There we go. And again, this graph is stretched. All right. So we have the first part of it, the idea that an A value is stretching or compressing. Can you see what's making it stretch versus compress? Right? Sometimes people say, ooh, fractions make it get compressed. But be careful, this fraction compressed the graph, but this fraction stretched it. I included a decimal here. This decimal stretched, but as a heads up, the decimal 0.5 would compress it. 0.5 is 1 half. 
how do we explain what's stretching versus compressing here? And hopefully you're thinking, ooh, wait, I bet it has something to do with 1. And you're right. Notice that our 1, 2, I'm going to erase this one, 3 A values that were larger than 1, right? 2, this is 1.5, and 2.2, all three of those stretched our graph, right, when A was larger than 1. However, this 1 half compressed it, and so we can say maybe A is less than 1. We're going to adjust that in just a bit. But for now, we're going to say if our slope's bigger than 1, stretch, smaller, compress. There's one more item you need to get out of here. So the last thing we need to realize is that our A value can also cause our graph to reflect, which is a fancy name for to say flip vertically over a line of symmetry. We briefly touched on the idea of a line of symmetry, and I've shown it on each of these graphs in red. This line of symmetry is like a line that you would fold your page over. And you could literally go through and you could crease your paper on this line, crease your paper, crease your paper. But what I'd like you to do is to take about one minute, and you're going to draw the reflection of this graph on the other side of that axis of symmetry. And by the way, all three of your graphs, even though they start in the same spot, will look different on the other side because of where that line of symmetry is. So go ahead and draw each one, and then unpause, and we'll see how you did. Take about a minute, please. Ready, set, go. All right. So when you fold this first graph over the line of symmetry, because the vertex is right on it, that's going to stay. But then these next two points that are up here are a distance of 1 away from the line of symmetry. So when you fold it, we need to make sure that they match up and that they are 1 away. You could also count the slope that's up 1 over 1, whatever sounds good to you. If it's up 1 over 1 and you reflect it, now the new slope will be down 1 over 1. Still makes an absolute value graph, but it is now going down instead of up. Let's try the next one. Our next graph has a vertex that is a distance of 1 away from the line of symmetry. So when it flips, it's still going to have that gap on the other side, and now it's going to be here. Then we can use that same trick, up 1 over 1 for our slope. Well, now it's got to be down 1 over 1 in each direction. And as we go through and graph that, hopefully better than I just did, we'll see that we get a graph that looks like this. And you'll notice that it is not the same as the purple graph, right? It's actually two units lower than the vertex of the purple one. Whoops, there we go. All right, last but not least, we've got this guy, which now has a distance of two from here. So on the other side, this isn't a big eye, this is just me showing the distance, um, has a big distance of two as well. But then the slope is the same. Up one over one becomes down one over one. And we really can't even see much of this graph here looks something like this. So if I erase those, I think maybe you would get a better indication of what these graphs are actually looking like. Okay, now um, we mentioned that our A value causes the graph to reflect, so let's see what happens. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead, jump back to Desmos, change your A value to these two, and see if you can fill out these two parts. You're going to have to circle either is or is not, and then same thing, you're going to see if it's compressed or stretched. Good luck, and we'll come back together once you have it. Ready, set, go. All right, well, let's do each of these together. I think when you change your A value to negative 3, and I'll double check for you guys right now, we're going to take this A down to negative 3. Notice that when A is bigger than 1, my blue graph is stretched. Once we get less than 1, now we're getting compressed. At 0, it's so compressed that it's flat. It's not even a V-shape anymore. And then we go negative. Whoa, negative flipped it down. So I'm just going over to negative 3 right here. Then we think, how would we graph this? Well, negative 3, if you look at this slope, goes down 1, 2, 3 over 1, down 1, 2, 3 over 1. Negative 3 over 1 looks to be the slope of this absolute value graph. So this stayed the same, but it's down 1, 2, 3 over 1, 1, 2, 3 over 1. There is a downward or negative facing line. And of course, we just do the same thing on the other side, down 1, 2, 3 over 1, down 1, 2, 3 over 1. 
There we go. Now, last but not least, so this graph is reflected when you compare it to the black one. What about comparing it to the black one? Is it stretched or compressed? And it might help you just to flip that black graph over, right, and go down one over one from the vertex. Then I think it makes it a little bit easier to see where this red graph is actually stretched from the black graph. It's not compressed, right? So this is kind of tricky when it's upside down. But yeah, this new red graph is still stretched. All right, try one more. Well, and hopefully you've already done it, so let's just go through one more. And maybe I can do this without Desmos. All right, I see that negative. I'm assuming the negative means this is going to be reflected again. And then we see our slope. So I'm going to go down one to the right three, down one to the right three, a little bit off the graph. Oh well, down one to the left three, down one to the left three. And here's my vertex. And we can go through and sketch and sketch. So it's certainly reflected. And if you were to re-sketch the black graph, which goes down one over one but vertically reflect it, hopefully we can see that the blue graph is certainly compressed from there. Oops, and my pen decided to be weird. There we go. All right. So we need to add a couple things to our hypothesis of how A is changing these graphs. Up above, we said anytime A is bigger than 1, the graph gets stretched. But when we came down here, we used the number negative 3. Negative 3 is definitely smaller than 1, but it stretched our graph. And then over here, we used negative 1 third, which is also smaller than 1, but it compressed it. So how do we describe that? Hmm. Well, I bet you could probably list some numbers that would stretch your graph, right? I bet if A was, let's list some numbers that would stretch our graph. So we already know, I'm going to put the little curly brace just to list a few numbers. Just taking the numbers here, we know that 2 stretched it, 3 halves, which is the decimal 1.5, stretched it, 2.2 uh, stretched it, and then all the way down here, negative 3 stretched as well. Hmm. What are some other numbers that might stretch our graph? Well, I bet negative 10 would stretch. Negative 5 over 2, that's the decimal negative 2.5 would stretch. Um, there'd be a whole bunch of them. So maybe I think to better answer this question, I'll say this is stretch. What wouldn't stretch our graph? What would compress our graph? And we know a few already. We know 1 half from right here. And we also, down below, know negative one-third. Hmm. Well, I will tell you, negative two-thirds will also compress our graph. And so will positive two-thirds. So how would you describe the numbers that stretch versus compress? Well, one nifty way to do this is on the top of the third page. So the top of the third page gives us this equation again, and we're just going to focus on the a value. Okay, let's run through these four. So first, they're going to say when the a value is greater than 0, our parent function is not reflected. Right? Greater than 0. Um, well, what are some examples of a that are greater than 0? Well, 1 half is bigger than 0, 2, 5, 1.1, 0 0.25. Those are all numbers that are bigger than 0. Those would all cause our absolute value function to look like this. All right? We'd say that makes the function open up. We should also consider the opposite. Right? If you have a values that are less than 0, let's just take these and make them negative. Right? Negative 1 half, negative 2, negative 5, negative 1.1, and so on and so forth. Right? Any of those slopes for our graph will cause our graph to go in a downwards direction. And that's because the parent function is reflected. That's what we saw on the previous page too, right? We saw this over here, it's reflected. All right, and then we get our last two. Now these ones bring in an absolute value. And you might be saying, well, there is absolute value, but not around the A. Why are they bringing in more absolute value? Well, and that's because it was pretty hard for us to describe which values compressed versus stretched our graph. And that's what the absolute value is going to do. They're saying if you take the absolute value of our A, 
it'll do something to our function. So let's look at each of these. If you take the absolute value of each of these, this will stay 2, that'll stay 3 halves, that'll stay 2.2. Ooh, absolute value of negative 3 will turn it to 3 and 10 and positive 5 halves. Absolute value would turn all these to positives. And if they were all positives and they're bigger than 1, what does that make our graph do? Oh, well, that stretches our graph. So when the absolute value of the slope is greater than 1, the function is vertically stretched. And the opposite is true. If you take the absolute value of your slopes, and I'll do this one in brown, if you take the absolute value of each of these, that will make them 1 half, 1 third, 2 thirds, and 2 thirds again. These are all decimals or fractions that are less than 1, though bigger than 0, and we saw that that caused our graph to get compressed, even down here. Absolute value, 1 third, compressed. Okay. So they asked for some examples. We did some up above, but we can do some more. Vertically stretched, well, 2, 5, 10, those all vertically stretch. Okay. But other ones could be 2.3, 7 halves, those would all vertically stretch, 7 halves is 3.5, but then we have some negatives as well. Let's just do the same numbers but make them negative. Negative 2, negative 5, negative 7 halves, right? Whether they're positive or negative doesn't matter. It's only the value when you ignore the sign, okay? And some ones that compress our graph, well, 1 half is the easy one, 1 fourth, 3 quarters, let's get some decimals in there. Right, 0 0.11, 0 0.9, anything less than 1. However, we can also do the negative versions. Negative 1 half, negative 1 fourth, all that does, does is flip our graph over, but it still compresses it, and so on and so forth. All right, so <clears throat> the last part of today has three parts. Part 1, part 2, part 3, and that's it. Um, really, to get out of here, you need to definitely have finished part one and part two. Uh, because we're on the video, uh, you really should finish all of this, though. Uh, and then you should expect a knowledge check either at the end of this class if we have time or next class. So I'm going to quickly explain what you're doing for each of the parts. Then you're going to try it. And then if you have extra time, you can finish off the video to see how I did it. Part one wants you to graph each of these absolute value equations without using Desmos. In fact, you won't need your phone for any more of today. When you graph it, you're going to go through and identify the vertex, explain how the graph is shifted. And we did a little bit of that last class, but if you need an example after you start working, you can always hit play. You'll explain if it's stretched or compressed by talking about the A value. Remember, that's the one half up here. So that's the A value you'll talk about. And if the graph is reflected or not, again, talking about the A value, the one half. Don't forget to actually graph the equation too. Part two is going to use the graphs up above. They say A and B, so the graphs A and B up above are A and B. And it's not the graph that's here, it's the graph that you're making. And they're going to ask you to find inputs and outputs. So don't forget that F of 1 actually means 1 is the input, what's the output? And so you'll want to look on your graph. Okay. And last but not least, you've got part 3. Part 3, I'm giving you six descriptions, and the descriptions require you to know what these graphs look like, too. So, for example, if on B they say begin with this graph, this is the parent function. And so I suggested you might want a whiteboard or a separate piece of paper, but on Part B I would start with the parent function, which we know looks like this, starts at 0, 0, and then tells you to do something. It says reflect the graph over the x-axis. So when it's reflected, my new graph looks like this. And then they're saying, okay, which graph down here matches that description? And oh, that looks a lot like description 5, right? These are Roman numerals. So I would say that B matches 5. And then they want to know what is the equation for this graph. To build your equation, you need the slope first, 
while the slope looks like 1 over 1. So 1 over 1, or just 1. But because the graph is going down, we know it's been reflected with a negative, just a single negative. And then we also know, of course, that this part at the end is the hk, or the vertex. This is 0, 0. So minus 0, plus 0. Because it's zeros, you can put plus or minus. It doesn't matter. And if you were feeling really good, you could even write that as just negative 1 times the absolute value of x. You don't need to write those zeros. In fact, you don't even need to write the negative 1. You can just do negative absolute value of x. Those are all the same thing. All right, so you know what your three parts are. Definitely part one and two done by the end of class. You'll need them on your knowledge check, and hopefully you get to part three as well. Um, if you get stuck or everyone wants to check their answers, you can unpause this video, and I'll go through the rest. Ready, set, go. All right, you're back. Maybe you needed a hint, and so you can watch me go through part A and then pause again for the rest, or you guys just want to check your answers. So let's rock and roll. Um, we're going to begin with the vertex here. Our vertex will be negative 1, 1, always the opposite of h. So negative 1, 1 is going to be right here. And we're going to talk about that shift. The shift is basically, we had the original vertex, this black point, which is right here. Where is the new vertex? And as a hint, it's just going to be your h and your k. Your new vertex is shifted one unit, and I'll say negative one units horizontally, right? That's left, right. And then one unit vertically. So again, h and k. When I say shifted, I mean moved from the original graph. Let's finish graphing this, though. To finish graphing, we're going to use our slope. And our slope says to go up 1 over 2. So I'm going to go up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. And there's the first part of my absolute value graph. Second try, didn't like how the line came out. There we go. And to finish it up, we go up 1 to the left 2. right? So to put all of this together, we just needed the vertex and the slope. Now, we have to discuss if this graph is stretched versus compressed on the original function. And that's a little bit harder because we moved the vertex, and it might be tough for you to tell is this wider or skinnier, or shorter, or taller than the original. So we're just going to look at my a value. When you do the absolute value of 1 half, it becomes 1 half. And how does 1 half compare to 1? Well, 1 half is less than 1. And if you look up above, when we did the absolute value, look at these two guys right here. We said if our a value becomes less than 1, the function is compressed. Now, you might have been able to visually see that this graph is shorter than the original one, and so you could have gotten compressed right away. But it's nice to see that you can just look at the slope and tell as well. And last but not least, clearly visually, this graph is not reflected. It's going the same way. But the main reason is that this 1 half that we saw here is greater than 0. And as long as your slope is bigger than 0, it doesn't reflect your graph. So now that you've had a nice explanation, go ahead and maybe pause me again and try the others, um, unless you were all confident and you just want me to roll through the answers. Ready, set, go. All right, so I am just going to go through the answers for the other three. Um, we'll see how you guys did. Uh, this one, we're going to do in a nice calming blue. So I'll start with the vertex, opposite of h, comma, k. And then we'll use our slope. Our slope is down 2 over 1 this time, so down 2 over 1. And we'll continue that out to get this guy. And same thing the other direction, down 2 over 1 to get the other side. There we go. Now let's answer our questions. How did we make that new vertex? Well, the original vertex was right here. It shifted to the right 1 and then up 2, which, again, are just the h and the k, because the h horizontally shifts the graph and the k vertically. Remember, I misspelled k for that, or misspelled vertically with it. Is this stretched or compressed? Well, to me, this looks skinnier. I think it's stretched. Um, but we can check that by looking at the absolute value of our a value. The absolute value of negative 2 is 2. How does 2 compare to 1? Well, 2 is larger. And so if we look up here, if it's larger, then it's stretched. And 
clearly because the graph is going down, it is reflected, and that's because my a value of negative 2, right, is less than 0. Anytime a is less than 0, your graph goes down. Part C, there's always a couple of these. Part C has a few pieces missing, and we've seen this before. I'll even write this out over here. This negative and then absolute value, we'll put an invisible 1 in front. There's a plus 1 at the end, so I already know that the k value is 1. But what about the h? If there's nothing adding or subtracting on the inside, and we've done this before, we can always put a 0. Plus 0, minus 0, it doesn't matter, but that gives us the point 0, comma 1. Alright, so here's my new vertex, 0, 1. We can see that that means I've been shifted 0 units horizontally, but one unit vertically, right? The original vertex was here and it shifted up one. Finishing this off, let's get the slope. My slope, and I've kind of run out of space here, is negative one over one. So down one over one. It looks like this. Or like this. There we go. Okay. And it says that it's neither stretched nor compressed, and that's because my a is negative 1, and the absolute value of negative 1 is 1. 1 equals 1, and if they're equal, then that's neither a stretch nor a compression. It didn't change. Again, though, it is clearly reflected because my a value of negative 1 is certainly less than 0. Last but not least, 3 halves times x minus 2. Do this one in purple. Um, as we go through and get this done, we need the vertex, and again, we see the number on the inside, so I know that's the h positive 2, but the number on the outside, what is adding there? Oh, that's right, a 0. Same as before, we add or subtract zeros any time. So my vertex is 2, 0. The original vertex was right here, it's been shifted 2 to the right, but 0 up. And then we need the rest of our graph. Ooh, a fraction, that makes the slope easy. Up, 1, 2, 3, over 2. Up, 1, 2, 3, over 2 is kind of off the graph. Up, 1, 2, 3, to the left, 2. Up, 1, 2, 3, to the left, 2. And we can go through and graph. My dog is staring at me like I'm a crazy person talking to myself, which I may be. All right. Um, this one could be a little bit harder to see if it's stretched or compressed because it looks pretty similar to the original. But we're just going to take that slope, 3 halves, we'll take the absolute value of it, and we should realize that 3 halves, if you do it on your calculator, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. And 1.5 is greater than 1, that means we are stretched. Last but not least, this is clearly not reflected, and that's because our a value is larger than 0. All right, so at this point you have all your graphs complete. Go ahead and try that part two again, and this is just matching. There's no math you need to do. You're just matching these eight questions to parts of the graph up here, and I'm actually going to clean this up because we're going to need this um, pretty nice looking on the graph. I'm going to go here, get rid of these guys, kind of get rid of my little green markings. So all you really need to focus on are the red graph and the blue graph. The red graph is f of x, the blue graph is g of x, and they will be able to answer all of the questions, right? The red graph um, was f, and the g of x was blue. So, use those to answer your questions, unpause me whenever you're done, and I'll stop petting my dog and come back and help you guys out. Ready, set, go. Alrighty, let's go ahead and get this part done. So, when they say f of 1, the long way around doing this is what they really mean by f of 1, and I'll erase this so we see the room, or uh, we have the room, is they want you to replace the x with 1. They want you to put in an input of 1 for your x's. So, they're putting in an input, we'll do this in red right here, of 1. But then that's a bunch of math that you have to do, and you can follow PEMDAS. You'll get the answer for it. That's what they're looking for. But there's another way to do this. F of 1 really means you're inputting 1 and getting an answer. And we can see that from our graph. An input is always an x value. And then where is the answer on the red graph that has an x value of 1? Oh, well, that's right here. That's the point 1, comma 2. Can you see it? 
1 comma 2 is on the graph. It wouldn't be, for example, 1 negative 4. That has an x of 1, but that point isn't on the red graph. So it's 1 comma 2. So if I jump down here, f of 1 is 2 because the point 1 comma 2 is on there. You don't need the point, um, but it couldn't help to remind you if you hypothetically had a knowledge check that asked you to do this. So let's try the same thing with g of 1, 1 comma something. g of 1, we're over here, here's 1, oh, here's the point, it's 1 comma 2. So I know that g of 1 is also 2. Well, that's exciting, maybe it's just the same all the way through. Let's complete another point. We already know the input, I said red, the input is negative 1, what's the output? f of negative 1 is just a fancy way to say the input's negative 1, what's the output? Well, I'm going to go to my graph, I'm going to go to negative 1, which is right here, and we'll look for the output on the red graph, which is this point. This is the point negative 1, comma 1, so f of negative 1 is 1. Same thing for g, we know the input, so let's find the output. The input is negative 1, where's the output? Um, oh, the graph is down here this time, so this is the point negative 1, comma, negative 2. We can do that. Negative 1, comma, negative 2. Yeah, not bad at all. Now, these next four look different. And the reason they look different is because they're asking you to find x values. So I'm going to kind of put answers down here. Notice there are two of them, x equals and x equals. So I'm going to put two sets of points. Because they're saying, what x can you put in here where the answer is 3? So it's really backwards. If you had asked that question up here, it would have said, what x value causes, I'll zoom in, sorry, f of x to equal 2? And we'd say, oh, that's 1, because f of 1 is 2. And so when we're doing it here, they're saying, what x value makes our function equal 3. 3 is the answer, or the y value, and we're trying to find the input. So they put it twice here. Let's see if we can figure out why. So the y value is 3. I'm jumping back up to my graph here, and I'm looking for a y value. So f of x is the same as y. The y value is 3. We're looking on the y-axis this time. And they're saying, what x value would give us a y value of 3? Then you might say, ooh, ooh, I found it. This point is 3 comma 3. I don't know why I put a negative, sorry. 3 comma 3. So when x is 3, the y value is 3. And you're right. So when x is 3, the y value becomes 3. But then why are there two points? Oh, because maybe you should look the other direction as well. Not only is there a point here, there's also one way over here. Right? So when the y value, or when the x value is negative 5, the y value is also 3. I don't think there are any other points on that graph where there's a y value of 3. You can kind of just cheat and just draw a line straight across, and it only intersects the graph in those two spots, right here and right here. So now that you have that idea, why don't you pause me one more time, try the last three, and then I'll quickly go over the answers and we can move on to part three. Ready, set, go. All right, here are the last couple. So this time we're looking for a y value of negative 4 on the g of x graph. Let's see, y value negative 4, let's clean this up a little bit. Here's the y of negative 4. I see an x of 4 and an x of negative 2. So I think there are two points there, 4 and negative 2, and you could check it. 4 comma negative 4 and negative 2 comma negative 4 are both on the graph. Back to the red, f of x equal to 2 this time. Let's see, 2 is right here. I see one point and another. So that's looking like negative 3 and positive 1. Negative 3, positive 1. Remember that as I scroll down. And last but not least, what's the value of x that causes g of x to equal 0? It says there's just one value this time. That's weird. I wonder why. Everything else is at 2. So that causes g of x to equal 0. Um, and I think if we look at this, g of x equaling 0 is right here, right? So here's 1, 2, 3. 0 is right in the middle. And um, I'd reiterate, I'm not quite sure why there's one answer. I think there should be 2. This is the point 2, comma 0. 
and 0 comma 0. I think there are two answers for this one. That's just a typo that I'll fix in the later years. So hopefully yours doesn't have this typo and yay. So if we look at this one, I see x equals 0 and x equals 2. Alrighty. So at that point, we are on to part three, which I already gave you a nice example of. I showed you what the parent function looked like, and I also gave you what the answer was for this one. I suggested that you'd probably want a separate piece of paper, and maybe a whiteboard to kind of sketch your process, and we already finished B. So try the others, try sketching the original and then moving, um, and then when you are stuck or ready to check your work at the end, unpause, and we'll go through it. Ready, set, All right, let's finish this off. We might as well just go A through F and see what we get. So I'm going to start with A. They want us to begin with the graph of F of X equals the negative absolute value of X. And here's how I do that. I'm just going to sketch over on this side. We have an X, Y axis. And I know the absolute value of X is the parent function. When you put a negative in front, it's just going to reflect the parent function. So we're going to do this. All right. And now it says translate that graph, move that graph two units left and three units up. Two left, three up. So two left and one, two, three up. They're saying take every point, I'll start with the vertex, and go two left and three up. We didn't change anything else about this though. Um, so that means that my new graph is going to have that same slope where my slope was negative or negative 1 or negative 1 over 1. So it's going to start here and go down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. I think I'm looking for a graph. Oh, I shouldn't have done it in that color. That looks like the original one. Um, I'm looking for a graph that is kind of floating up here. I'm going to label the vertex, too. I think that will be useful at negative 2, comma 3. Let's see, do I have any graph at negative 2, comma 3? Um, pretty close. I have a graph that's at negative 3, 2. I wonder if I did mine backwards. 2 left, 3 up. Oh, no, it's down here. I found it. This is the graph, negative 2, comma 3, and the slope matches 2, down 1 over 1. This has got a match description A. When we write our equation, the slope is down 1 over 1. I'm going to leave off the over 1, though. We don't need to write it. And then HK, HK. Oh, but don't forget opposite of h, so this should be a plus 2. This is the equation that creates the graph, and it's the new graph we made from our description. 4 to go. Here is part c. Part c says start with this graph. We'll do this one in purple. Okay, 2, x plus 3 minus 4. All right, so do the same thing. Let's erase my old one. That's why I said you might want a whiteboard just for your process here, but that's okay. Um, we're going to go through... And 2x plus 3 minus 4, I think my starting point will be negative 3, negative 4. So I'm going to make sure that I go out negative 3, kind of a bit this way, definitely a bit down here. So negative 3, negative 4, negative 3, negative 4, and we'll do this in purple for the original, looks like this. And then we have a slope of 2 over 1, so up 2, so up 1, 2 over 1 up 1, 2 over 1, and I'll do the same thing the other way, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. Okay, so here is my original function, give or take, it doesn't have to be perfect. Then they want us to reflect this graph vertically. So when we vertically reflect something, that's when we flip it over. So can you picture what this vertical reflection looks like? If it's opening up, I think the vertical reflection is now going to be pointing down. Okay. And then, so we reflected it vertically, and then it says shift the graph up 3 and right 2. So let's see, I'm going to go up 1, 2, 3, so that's right here, and then right 2. There's my new one. And I guess I probably should have done this in a different color. I went up 3, right 2, and now we have my new graph, which still has that same 2 over 1 slope just going down. So down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. It's going to look something like this. All right, so it looks like my vertex is at negative 1, negative 1, and it has that negative 2 slope. Let's see if we have any of these. Negative 1, negative 1. Ooh, I see one right here. We already know it's not 4 and 5. So, um, yeah, this looks pretty good. Negative 1, negative 1, and if we check the slope, 
it is down 2 over 1. Sweet. OK, let's get this equation written. The slope is negative 2 over 1, which is just negative 2. And then minus 1 minus 1, except we do the opposite of h, so it becomes a plus 1. And there we go. This matched description c. And then there were three. All right, our fourth problem, which is d, does something pretty similar. It asks us to go through and graph this and then do things to it. So we'll do the same thing again. I'm going to see if I can just keep my same x, y axis here so I don't have to keep redrawing it. Advantages of our software looks pretty good. Um, so we have 3, 4, right? Positive 3, positive 4. So I'm going to go right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to go right 1, 2, 3, and up 1, 2, 3, 4. There we go. And then we use our slope. 2 over 1 again. Nice. So up 1, 2, over 1, 1, 2, over 1, something like this. Great. What do they want us to do? Reflect this graph over the x-axis. Ooh, that's a tricky one. So what they're saying is, here's the x-axis. I'll show it to you in maybe red. Here's the x-axis. This is our line of symmetry. They want us to flip this green graph over that line of symmetry. And so to do that, we're going to really count how far away this is from my line of symmetry. It looks like it's 1, 2, 3, 4 away. And I'll kind of show that right here. Which means when I flip it, I need to go 4 below. 1, 2, 3. So all the way down here. So my vertex was up here. Now it's way down here, all right? Um, and so I might as well, it's reflecting, so it's flipping over too. Down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. So it looks something like this. Whew. All right, but am I done? Oh, no, now we need to shift the graph. So they say shift it to the left 2 units, so over 1, 2, that's right here, and then up three units, up one, two, three, that's way up here. So I went left two and then up three. There we go. Keep that same slope though. So down two over one, down two over one, and now we have my new graph. So I'm looking for a graph that looks like it has a vertex at one comma negative one and goes down two over one. So one negative one this time. Do we see any of those? Ha! Looks like three. This is 1 comma negative 1. Excellent. So we know hk form opposite of h comma k. And then my slope is down 2 over 1. And as we covered, negative 2 over 1 is fine, or just negative 2. And that should be a description d. And then there were two. <clears throat> Part E, begin with the parent function y equals the absolute value of x. Well, that's easy. Thank you for giving us the parent function where we don't have to do anything too crazy. Right. Well, hopefully. So I'm getting rid of all this, just cleaning it up. And here's our parent function. Our parent function starts at 0, 0, goes up 1 over 1. Great. What are we doing next? Translate the function 2 units up, 3 units left. 2 up, 3 left. So we're going to go up 1, 2, and then 3, 1, 2, 3 left. All right, here's my new one. Still has the same slope as the parent function, up 1 over 1. And are we done? Ah, then we have to reflect it over the x-axis. OK, so like before, we're going to use the x-axis as our line of symmetry here, and we're going to flip it over. It looks like it is currently 2 away from the x-axis. Oops, there we go. And so when I flip it, we need to go 2 below, which is right about here. There we go. And when it reflects, now it's the same slope but going in a downward direction. All right, vertex looks like it's at negative 3, comma, negative 2. And my slope was just going down 1 over 1. All right, does anything match that? Negative 3, negative 2. Oh, I found it. It's right here. OK. So we have negative 3, negative 2, HK form positive 3, negative 2, and the slope is down 1 over 1, which again you could write as negative 1 over 1, or just negative 1, or just a negative if you wanted. So whatever appeals to you. 
All right, even though we know that the last one, f, is going to match number one, let's make sure we understand it. Always better than just process of elimination. And it looks really similar to e, so let's see why the graph looks different. So it says, again, begin with the parent function. Sweet, I don't even have to erase as much this time because the parent function's already there. Love that. All right, and let's look at the directions. The directions are the same too, right? It says two up, three left, two up, three left, and reflect over the x-axis. So isn't it the same? But I think the order of directions are different. This one suggested first that we should reflect the function. So right away, this is going to get reflected like so. Then we're going to translate. So two units up, so up, two, and then three left. One, two, three. It's still a downward moving absolute value equation, but now it has a starting point of negative three comma positive two. And we can see that match over here, negative three two, it does match description F, phew, didn't make any mistakes this time. Um, and it should be a positive three, positive two with that same negative slope. All right. Hopefully you're feeling pretty confident on these graphs. I would say, yeah, this last section, part three, is definitely the trickiest section with a lot to it. Um, but parts one and two are pretty darn important. Part one, you need to be able to graph and talk about stretched and compressed. Part two, you need to be comfortable with function notation and matching function notation to graphs. So what did we cover today? Well, we discussed how to dilate, which is stretching and compressing, compressing, and reflect absolute value functions. So thank you for tuning in, and I'm excited to have you back for lesson 5.6 next time.